in tonight's program, I want to get across enough communication theory to make you all dangerous so that you understand just enough to know why things work, why things don't, uh, why some communication practices will be more successful for you as opposed to others. So let me fill up the screen and walk you through my best understanding of why people understand each other and why they don't. Now, communication theory is really old, but in some ways it's very new. The first person to really think about communication theory was Aristotle in classical Greek times. What was interesting about the way the Greeks did democracy was there were not courts. Every citizen would have to go into the general stadium and make his own argument for why this fellow stole his goat or his wife or, or did whatever it was he did to him. And then the general public would decide, based on those arguments, who should win that case. Now, most citizens were not trained as public speakers. So they would go to these specialists called sophists. And those people, for a fee, would teach them how to do good public speaking before they had to go into the stadium to argue their case. From which we get a modern word that you don't hear much called sophistry, which just means all the tricks of public speaking, not necessarily substance, but knowing all the tricks and, and gimmicks. So everything was about being a good sender, that you were going to be a great orator, and if you could give a good speech, you would win, and if you didn't give a good speech, you would lose. Now, Aristotle considered this, and he felt, number one, it wasn't right that you had to go hire somebody to teach you how to represent yourself, but secondly, he thought that being a good speaker was not everything that you needed to know. So Aristotle wrote three books that together we call Rhetoric, and one book is all about the sender, about being a good speaker, but another book was all about the receiver, understanding your audience, because after all, if the people in the stadium didn't vote for you, you lost. So the other people controlled whether or not you were going to win or lose. So you should understand your audience. Who are these people? What do they think? Where do they come from? What do they know about my subject? So there's two of us here, the sender and the receiver. And whenever we talk about this kind of transaction, because the receiver controls whether or not you are successful, the receiver is always more important than you are. Let me let that sink in. The receiver is always more important than you are. Now, up till now, everything you've been learning in this program is about you how to write good stories, how to take good pictures, how to do good audio editing, how to make good uh, graphics. So all of those things were about you and your performance. Granted, we talked some about the receivers, but mostly it's been about you showing off, less about influencing the receiver of your message. So if I take a great photograph and it gets on the cover of a magazine, the reason they do that is not because they think I made a nice picture. It's because they think my picture will sell more magazines, that it will stop people going by the newsstand and they will buy the magazine with my picture on it instead of somebody else's. So the purpose of it is to influence the receiver, not to make me feel good that I took a great picture, but to get somebody to look at that picture and buy the magazine or vote for my candidate or whatever it is I want that other person to do. So the other person is always in charge of whether you win or lose. Therefore, more of our thinking ought to be about the other person, less about ourselves. After all, why publish your story if you don't need somebody to look at it? You could just type it up and look at it yourself and feel good because you wrote a nice story. But until you put it on your website until you distribute that video, until you put it out on Facebook or wherever you distribute it, 
and nobody looks at it, what difference did it make? And the reason people do journalism is to make a difference, to hold the government accountable, to educate the public, to entertain the public. So we have some purpose that has to do with the other people, not with ourselves. So Aristotle's second book was about understanding your audience. The third book was about putting together the message itself. So how do we compose it? How do we open uh, our pieces of information? I often would tell my students in speech classes, if you have a good opening and a good closing and you don't screw up the middle, people will think you gave a good speech. So the way that you frame it, the way you set it up and conclude it. This even goes with how you lay out your web page and where your pictures are pasted. So that does your picture point into your story? Does the paragraph that goes with that picture appear near that picture so that logic puts them together? The human mind wants to see patterns. It tries to create organization. So if you put a picture next to a paragraph, as the reader, I'm going to think those go together because that's where you put them. So nothing ever happens by accident. So Aristotle's three books were about senders, messages, and receivers, that if you didn't master all three parts, you weren't going to get anywhere. So you had to be good at, uh, in his day, the oration, the speech techniques of a sender, but you also had to compose a good logical and emotional argument, which is your message, and you had to understand who was listening, who was receiving your message, and what characteristic about them that you could play into to help get your point over. So if you didn't do all three of those parts, you were going to fail. You were not going to get all the way to the end. One of the things we have to understand about our receivers is every one of them is prejudiced. Every one of them has some filters in place by which they screen out messages that they receive. For example, I don't listen to young people because they haven't been anywhere, they haven't done anything, they have no life experience, why should I pay attention to them? But also, I don't listen to old people because they always tell you how it was when they were young and how easy you have it and how tough they had it, and they don't understand current culture, so I don't listen to them. And I don't listen to foreigners because they're not from around here, so they don't understand America. They have their French way of thinking, and they don't think like me. And all of those are exaggerations, but everybody has got some of those little things ticking along in their head that keep them from looking at certain magazines, TV stations, websites, billboards, whatever it might be. Some people are just automatically going to be predisposed a little bit against whatever you're trying to tell them. We talk about this in research classes as something called selective perception. You probably know it as people only hear what they want to hear. So if you and I were sitting together watching the same speech, but had different political viewpoints, each of us would listen to the same speech and take away points that reinforced why we were right and why you are wrong. And you would hear it the opposite way, both of us listening to the same person or reading the same article because we would screen out the stuff that would make us uncomfortable, the things that would disagree with our own beliefs, and then we would highlight the things that made us feel good that agreed with what we already thought. So these filters are in place for everybody. If I'm trying to sell you a product, why do I call it $4.99 instead of $5? Because I'm sensitive that you uh, as a receiver will think of a $5 bill as a thing. But you'll look at $4.99, well, that's some ones and some change. So I am trying to get into the way you filter your thinking about money. That's why we round prices down a little bit when we sell products. We're never going to say that that car is $15,000. It's $14,993. Now, we all know that that price is not that exact, that that is something that the car dealer is doing to make it sound like it's not a $15,000 car. So they're trying to hold it down just a little bit to make it feel a little bit better when it goes through your filters about how expensive a car ought to be. So 
understanding your audience and why they would screen out your story or why they would actually funnel it in because they would be more interested. When I am traveling and I look at USA Today, because that's the free paper they always throw uh, at the door of my room, they always have a page in there for news around the country. So there's 50 different states that each have one story about them that takes up a paragraph. So I look at Texas, because that's where I was born, Florida, it's where I live now, Ohio, where I used to live, because that's where my father's family's from, and Maine, because that's where I went to school for a time. So I'll look at those four states. If I have time, I'll look at some of the others, but I am filtering out the other 46 states because they don't make any difference to me. I don't care what's happening in Idaho. I'm sure Idaho is full of nice people, and I'm sure they're very interesting, and they have nice trees and everything. But I've never been there, so my filter says, eh, not so important. If I got time, I'll look at all those stories. But if I don't have time, I'll look at where I live, where I used to live, and I'll move on. So how do you generate local interest for one of your stories? You don't want your headline to say, man does interesting thing, because that doesn't tell me enough. You want to tell me, local farmer finds two-headed snake. So I at least know it's in the area. I know it's a farm story. There's an interesting animal. And if that's enough to get through my filters to make me pause and look for the picture of the weird snake, I actually did a two-headed snake story when I was a young reporter, then... Maybe you get through my filters, and that is now more interesting to me than something else going on on that same page. When you look at your Facebook feed, you look at your Twitter feed, you can't possibly read all that stuff. So what you're doing is you're looking for keywords that will be of interest to you, and then you look at other keywords that you know are not interesting. Like if you don't care about sports, anything that says baseball in the headline, you're moving on. So you're automatically screening out sports stories if you don't care about it. So understanding what receiver, uh, what filters the receiver will have in play have a lot to do with you figuring out how to get through them or even deciding if that receiver is even anybody that you care about. Maybe that's part of the audience you're not even writing for. But knowing that there's that slice that you don't have to compensate for in your story allows you to write more about the things for people that will be interested. So Aristotle never talked about these filters. He kind of got around it in uh, the way he analyzed the audience. But yeah, everybody has little prejudices and biases that we need to try and recognize to either work around them, work through them, or give up on them entirely. Another important thing for you to understand is that your message is going to go through some kind of pipe. Technically, we call that a channel, but I don't want you to think about that like a TV channel or a radio station, because the channel could be me standing out in a public park with a bullhorn giving a speech. It could me, be me buying a billboard. It could be me putting a vinyl wrap on my car to sell some product. Up in Ohio, like I said, where dad's uh, people were from. One of the best ways to get your barn repainted was to let them put a billboard for chewing tobacco on the roof or on the side for people to look at as they went down the country road. So, so the channel was the roof of a barn, and there'd be big ads up there for mail pouch or uh, red man chewing tobacco. But the best way to get your barn painted for free was to let the chewing tobacco company paint your barn and put an ad on the side. So the channel could be all kinds of stuff. This could be uh, like us on Facebook. And if you think about it, the only reason companies want you to like them on Facebook is so they can push ads and coupons at you. So that when you tell them you like Olive Garden, you're not really telling your friends that you like fake Italian food. What you're doing is telling Olive Garden yeah, I go there enough. I'll take a $2 off coupon when you got one. So the channel, the Facebook like or follow us on Twitter, is actually a gimmick for companies to get you to allow you to receive advertising from them. So what you're really doing is 
turn yourself over to the advertising mechanism of whatever companies you like. Now, if I like a company because I use their product and I would like their coupons or their specials or their buy one, get one up free or whatever is going on, sure, I don't mind liking AMC theaters if it gets me free popcorn once a month. That's all right. I don't mind them telling me when a new movie's coming out because I might forget. If they get too annoying, I will unlike them. But that is a channel by which they have found a way to move a message to me and they're getting it through my filter and recognizing that I'm somebody that likes movies, so I would receive information about movies. So the channel in which you package your information is every bit as important as what the message is itself. Think about how much importance you would give to a story that was on <coughs> A major television network, meaning a little number on your TV, like here, Channel 4 is NBC. So if it's on the NBC Nightly News, it's on a little number on the TV, I think that's really important. If it's on Channel 258, probably not so important. So it's not just that it's on television. <clears throat> Which television network? When you listen to the radio, if you listen to your radio when you are driving around, <coughs> the highest paid radio announcers are in the mornings between 6 and 9 because that's when more people are in their cars listening to the radio. So you want to have your best person in there to draw the best audience so I can charge more advertising money. So the time of day of the show is a kind of channel in addition to the show being on radio. In addition to whether it's a rock and roll station or a news talk station or a country station or a sports station or a public broadcasting station. So all of them are part of what channel it is by which you're sending your message. One of the instructors <coughs> over in the PR program always tells me when he has a student who says, in their thesis paper, my audience is everybody. Nobody's audience is everybody. The Pope's audience isn't everybody. So you are trying to find the slice of audience that is interested in your stuff. You're trying to build the kind of message that they would look at, and you're trying to move it to them through a channel that is appropriate for them. If you want to read a long article about foreign policy, you're probably going to read a thick magazine. You're probably not going to read that off some free website. You're going to get it out of a magazine that costs 10 bucks a copy. Now, the person who writes for that magazine is going to have more prestige as a writer because of where that article appeared, that it was in Foreign Affairs, where it was in International Review. And you go, wow, that's a big magazine. That's important. This guy must be really smart. So the channel not only helps you deliver your message, but it adds more flavor, more character, more prestige to your message. Sometimes when you students put out a good story, I might retweet it when you tweet it to me as part of your homework. Why do I do that? Partly to help you all get more exposure, partly to show off the good work my students are doing, but also people that follow me might not be the same people that follow you. So I'm moving it from your pipe to my pipe, which might flow more water than yours. And then if some big people who follow me push your story even further, you go from your hundred followers to my thousand to their million. So it's all about moving it around. Footnote, all of you ought to follow each other on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, period, end of story. All of you ought to follow each other. When you send out your tweets for your homework, if one of you thinks your buddy did a cool story, retweet that. Even if it's not your main audience, just add a little note to it and said, one of my classmates wrote this great story. And if you keep promoting each other, you will build bigger pipes, more networks, more connections. I just heard, in fact, over the weekend, 
from one of the students I had in the 80s, who is now a big deal with the Disney digital media out in Hollywood. And we'll probably catch up. He'll He's following me now again on Twitter and everything so that I'll get news from Disney from him. He'll get news from Full Sail from me, and he's heard of us, and they hire our graduates. So you don't know when a connection 30 years from now is going to pay off for you, whatever Twitter is going to be a generation from now. But you keep up with these people because you can add their channels to your channels and multiply, not just add, and get more audience that way. Now, if I've done everything right, I have sent my message carefully crafted through the correct channel. I have allowed for your filters. I have picked the right kind of receiver. How come people still don't understand me correctly? The reason is other distractions. And we use the technical term of noise to describe them. Noise can be all kinds of things. It doesn't have to be anything that you can hear. Now, I know I heard a siren in the background, and I actually live on a street here that is a secondary road for fire trucks in my neighborhood, so sometimes I hear them. That's okay. But that's one very basic example of noise. Noise can be if I am giving a speech and my speaking time is from 11 to noon. Because about 11.45, People are getting hungry. They're starting to shuffle their feet. They're starting to whisper to each other about where they want to go for lunch, and they have quit listening to me. So about 1140 in my speech, I need to be getting very interesting, very funny, have an activity. I need to do something because I know the technical noise of them being hungry will compete with me. If it's the end of the day, and I'm speaking at 4 o'clock, and happy hour is at 5, I'm in the way between people and their drinks. And again, I got to work knowing that my time of day is a problem, and that is technically noise that distracts from people paying attention to my message. When I taught in Panama City, some of the uh, classrooms overlooked the bay. You can imagine how interesting it was for people to listen to me going over the parts of a good resume or going over good proofreading technique when they could look out the window and see people surfing and sunbathing and sailing right out there on the water and on the beach. I learned to close the blinds in my classroom because all that interesting stuff out the window was noise compared to what I was trying to teach. So noise is anything that is not you, me, or the message that could distract us. I've been in a lot of conferences where you sit on terrible chairs in hotel ballrooms. When my butt hurts, that's noise. We actually have a saying in the training business, the brain can only absorb what the rear end can endure. So if you don't let people get up and stretch every 45, 50 minutes, they'll quit listening to you because their butt hurts. So all of those things are potentially noise. If the room is too hot or too cold, if your story is in the magazine and it's opposite the swimwear or lingerie ad, more people are going to look at that picture than they're going to look at your story. If your billboard is on a busy highway with a hundred other billboards, that billboard better have some interesting pictures or big discounts or something on it to get my attention, or I'm just not going to see it in the blur of all the other billboards going down the highway. That's why television commercials are louder than television shows, and the government actually has, has a regulation for how much louder commercials are allowed to be. Because we know when the commercial comes on, you're going to get up and go to the kitchen or go to the bathroom. So the commercial's volume will be a little bit higher to overcome the noise of you shuffling around or opening the refrigerator or whatever you might do other than listening to my commercial about toothpaste. So be aware, noise can be all kinds of stuff. By this definition, and it's something that we will get into in a couple of weeks, 
if your website loads slowly because your pictures are too high a resolution for the internet, that's noise. Because if it takes too long for your web page to load and I get tired of waiting on it, I'll go click and look at something else. So your pictures need to pop up quickly. You probably want lower resolution pictures on your web page. And then if they want to click through and see the beautiful uh, high resolution one, you can stash that on a secondary page or in another directory. But if you want to hold my attention, I can't be looking at a box and an hourglass twirling and twirling waiting for this story. I'll move on and go look at something else because the Internet has a very short attention span. So slow page loading times are noise, every bit as much as an uncomfortable chair or being hungry. Now, have we allowed for everything possible? Only half. Because we have to give the receiver an opportunity to tell us whether or not we're doing a good job. Now, will the feedback that we get from the receiver be in the same form as what I put out to the receiver? If you put an article on your website and you have a comment box at the bottom, they may write something back to what you wrote. That's wonderful. You wrote 10 paragraphs, they wrote one, but you had writing coming back to write it. But if you're going down the highway and you see a billboard, are you going to go buy your own billboard to tell those guys how much you liked their billboard? No, you're either going to buy their brand of beer or you won't. This means that feedback could be sales. So I buy a billboard, you buy beer. I buy a TV commercial, you vote for my candidate. So feedback could be sales, it could be votes, it could be Facebook likes, it could be Twitter followers. However, what's the point of having a bunch of likes and follows if nobody does anything with it? So just having people go click, 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 I like it, I like it, I like it, doesn't really help anything. Later on in one of your assignments in this class, I'm going to ask you to go comment on other people's websites. And you're going to do that for two reasons. First, you're going to give feedback to what those other people wrote. So you should be looking for people that you're interested in, that are the best writers about your subject that you pay attention to. And you go and uh, put a paragraph up on one of their articles. And it should not just be, I really like your article. I'm a big fan. I read your stuff all the time. Because that's not helpful. Instead, comment on something they said in their article. Add something to it. Say, your article reminds me of something else I read that said this, this, and this. And here is, in fact, a link to something I wrote about that. So you're using that to promote yourself politely, but also to engage in conversation with that author and that author's other readers. But in most of the, the world, we don't get to write back to the people that write to us. I think this is one of the cool things about publishing on the internet instead of a magazine, because online, anybody that sees your article can click to that comment field and get involved at the bottom. But if you pick up a magazine, the magazine might have 200 pages, and it's only got two pages devoted to letters from readers. So by proportion, Online, we can give much more feedback to the people that send us messages. If you invite feedback about your messages, try not to get your feelings hurt because everybody is not going to like what you do and everybody is not going to agree with you. That's okay. Even if they come on to disagree with you, that at least means they read you and you move them to think about something. So a good critic is every bit as useful to me as a fan. Now, when that feedback comes to me, it's got to get through my filters too. I have trouble reading feedback that is not in good grammar with good spelling because that tells me this person didn't care enough to think about what they were saying. I spent a lot of time writing what I put out. I hope they spend a little bit of time writing what they give back to me. When I was uh, managing the college newspaper at another institution, we would get a lot of letters from inmates 
in the state prison who wanted us to just put in their uh, prisoner number and uh, just they were looking for pen pals because they were all innocent and had never done anything and they sure were lonely and they wanted some letters from college girls. Yeah, I'm not putting those in my newspaper. I'm sure I threw away sometime in those five years one letter from a legitimately honest, innocent, lonely, nice person. But I'll bet you most of them were potential swindles for college girls to fall in love with a romantic inmate and send him money. And I was not going to be a party to that with our paper. So that was a filter that I had about uh, the run of letters I would get looking for prison pen pals. I put more uh, stock in typed letters that we received in the office rather than handwritten letters. So all kinds of things about the, the format of the message, where it was coming from, how it was being put together. They had to fight through my filters before they could get into my respectable publications, which meant that whatever feedback we received was going through some kind of channel. Angry phone calls got one kind of treatment from me. Thoughtful letters got another kind. So the channels by which people sent us feedback could be every bit as important as what they had to say. And guess what? The noise multiplied. Because if I got lots and lots of mail, I didn't have a lot of time to look at every letter in the evaluation process. So we could be impacted by the sheer volume of mail, by how much time we had to look at it, whether or not we were trying to get out before Christmas break. So all kinds of things could be noise interfering with our ability to pay good attention to your feedback. So we've had a sender. We moved something over to the receiver. We dealt with those hurdles. We gave the receiver the chance to talk back to us, and we looked at those hurdles. So that's 50-50. Are we done? Of course not. I still got another slide. All communication takes place somewhere. If I tell you, stop by the boss's office on your way home tonight, does that environment imply good news or bad? Most of us don't think going to the boss's office is a good thing. What if I tell you, I want you to come meet my parents? Uh-oh, our relationship just got serious. So home field advantage has a lot to do with how we understand communications. In fact, since I'm teaching this from home tonight instead of from the office, I am much more comfortable. I probably am speaking more easily tonight because I'm at home in my chair and I don't have to worry about anybody walking in on me and I can have my Diet Dr. Pepper and everything is good in my world. So my environment makes me better set up to do a good job teaching you tonight than if I were doing it from the office where the chair is not as comfortable and I don't have my own stuff to eat and drink. If I was going to give you bad news, a smart manager would come down and talk to you at your desk and visit where you've got your family pictures and uh, your little uh, toys and, and gimmicks and things that make you feel good at your desk. I would rather come and sit and talk to you at your desk if I have to tell you um, some bad news because I want you to be comfortable. I don't want to call you in and try and intimidate you. Bad managers do that. Bad managers make you sit in a little chair while they sit in their big chair so they can look down on you and intimidate you. And in business school, we try and teach people to look at that the other way. So the environment in which you receive the communication changes it. I was teaching a lesson, more Aristotle stuff, about how to analyze political speeches. And it happened that that lesson came up the same week that President Obama was going to be inaugurated for the first time. And I thought, what a perfect example of a speech. That is the most watched speech. It's historic. I think we'll analyze that speech. I had no idea what he was going to say, 
but I knew that we could use those techniques to study it and have a good lesson about it. Unfortunately, I had to miss class that week. I had to be out of town at a meeting. So I told my students, I still am going to have you analyze Obama's speech, and I gave them a worksheet and an assignment so that when we got back together, we could take the speech apart. Now, I listened to it at my meeting during lunch. They put it up on the big TV in the hotel ballroom. So everybody in the audience acted like they were at an inaugural dinner and they were actually applauding during the speech, which I thought was kind of dumb because we're in Florida and he's in Washington and he can't hear you. They even applauded for the musical part. And I thought, well, that's even on tape because they said in advance it was so cold that the strings on the instruments would be out of tune. So they played a rehearsal recording. So I thought, this is this is not right. People are reacting artificially to this speech, but because we're in a big ballroom, everybody is looking at each other about how they're reacting to the speech. Some students watched it live on TV at home. Some watched it by replay on the internet. One student actually told me she watched it on the airplane. She was flying back from the West Coast, and they had those little TVs in the backs of the seats, and they streamed the inaugural speech into the seat backs while everybody was flying. And she said people were applauding on the airplane, too. The way we each experienced that speech, where we were, how we saw it, whether we saw it on a big TV, the back of an airline seat, all of that changed the environment for how we interacted with that message. So the whole transaction became different because we were not all in the same classroom watching the same speech together. So the environment for your stuff, your web page is one thing. You put it on Facebook, that's different. You tweet it, that's different because each one of them is a different environment in addition to being a different channel for pushing your message around. So I'm going to open up the floor for questions. Let me uh, un uh, undo my control panel here. So did that make any sense in trying to break down how communication works and how you can use this knowledge to get yourself over? Was there any part of that that was confusing or uh, that you no, didn't understand? Nothing's confusing at all. It's, it's, um, it's, it's great. Um, a lot of great information, information that I needed. Um, to use for not only my website for school, but also my other website that I'm tr having a hard time, um, you know, just bringing people in. And um, I, I think this is uh, pretty interesting, actually. Well, each one of these terms on the screen could be a chapter in a book, and they yeah. were. Uh, but I try and boil it down to the practical so that it's news you can use. I'll tell you something about drawing a web audience and it's advice that I actually gave a friend of mine who was having dating difficulties because he said, what's wrong with me? And I said, nothing's wrong with you. You need to keep going to the places that you normally go and doing what you normally do. So if you like country music or if you like going to the bookstore or you like going to arts and crafts or whatever, you go do and be wherever it is you would naturally be. And then you will wind up being around people that like that same stuff. But if you decide, well, gee, I want to meet girls, so I'm going to go take a cooking class, except the only thing you like about cooking is eating, then that's artificial, and it's really not going to do anything authentic for you. I find that drawing readers to your website, getting Twitter followers and all of that, should happen organically. That if you continue to put out useful information, and you keep putting it in front of the kind of people that you think would find it interesting, more and more, you'll find they will start picking you up. I never even used Twitter until I came to Full Sail last summer. And now, um, Judge Alex on TV follows me on Twitter. And I'm going, well, why did you pick me up? And he said, because you put out interesting news. You put out some stories I don't see anywhere else. Because I got yeah. some of these sources overseas, so I pay attention. Things I'm interested in include uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, 
Egypt, science fiction, uh, higher education. So I collect uh, my Homeland Security sources. I get all kinds of weird little stories about bomb robots and stuff. And I push them around because I check them and I get the story straight from Israel or straight from Singapore. And I check it and make sure it's good before I put it out. And what happens is if I do a good job at my end, the right kind of people that I want paying attention to me, they will find me. So it will naturally grow. And you'll find that once you start picking up momentum, you'll check your inbox and you go, I got two more Twitter followers. I don't even know these people. Where did they come from? But somebody liked something you did and they moved it to somebody else. And then a third person decided, wow, Charlene is interesting. I'll add her to my list. So keep doing the right thing and you will draw the traffic that you're supposed to have. The right kind of people that are interested in what you're doing. I mean, you can go right. out and buy Literally, you can buy a thousand Twitter followers. There's companies that will do that. But if you do <laughs> that, you're going to wind up flooded with a bunch of ads from China trying to sell you knockoff uh, designer purses that you're going right. to get hit with so much spam, it's ridiculous. So you can go get a bunch of fake followers to make your numbers look good, or you can have those two or 300 people that really know who you are and what you're doing and are really interested. And then if each one of them gets a friend every couple of months, pretty soon that really grows. And I would let that snowball happen naturally. If you do the right stuff, and we'll talk in this course about how to put yourself on more search engines and show you some techniques and services that will help you do that. And that'll get you some bursts of legitimate followers. But truly, if you have a social media work plan where... I'm going to spend the first 30 minutes every day doing my thing and cleaning out my inbox. And then before I go home, I'm going to do it again. Your natural activity is going to draw natural viewership and readership. Right. If you fake it, you'll pick up fake stuff and uh, you won't be happy with that. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, we had a good visit. And uh, I'll send out an announcement for next week. I expect next week we'll do Monday night instead of Tuesday night. So what do we have to do as far as our discussion board this week in the assignment? I'm sure it's up on the activities list. I'll, I'll, I'm going to get into that right after um, we finish here. But yeah. um, Your publication is, there... is very simple this week, really. Okay. Um, you're going to do one story this week, and you're going to do one story the last week of the class which are more to keep you in practice than anything else in working your beat. But your discussion board assignments right now are going to be much more about your social media plan, who do you pay attention to, what websites do you follow, and getting you uh, tuned up going into your thesis phase. So um, most of your discussion board activity is really going to be worksheets and checklists and performing some activities. And then as each of you post what you have done, then you could give each other some suggestions and say, ooh, I didn't think of doing that, or I think that's interesting. But uh, right now, really, it is your individual work plan. Okay. So my, my job this month is coaching you through promoting your website through the right vehicles and to the right kind of audience. And then each week, your discussion activity is really about that. We're really not discussing great ethical issues or, or hallmark news stories. Now what oh, we're discussing perfect. is how you're promoting yourself. And each week you have a different activity to help you uh, get, get out there. Oh, wow. This is great. This is going to be really interesting. Well, now is the time because for the last several months you've been generating content. You've built up your website. You got some stories. You got some artwork. Now we got to figure out how to get that out in front of the public. Right. And, and one of my goals, um, because I'm just mercenary that way, is figuring out how to get you paid. Oh, yeah. That's great, right? That would be <laughs> – I would love to figure that out. <laughs> well, we'll have one whole talk like this about 
how to figure out where to sell your stories, what are the ins and outs of the business, um, how, when you should expect to get paid, all those kinds of things. So I'll teach a whole session about that, monetizing your material. Got it. Okay. So this is not about the study of public relations. This is about managing your public relations, managing your reputation, and getting you promoted effectively. Yeah. All right. All righty. Great. Thank you. All right. Dig in and carry on, and we'll talk next week. Okay, great. See you then. Good night.